Now, in the last in the current series of cracking crime cold cases, the Gardaí look back over a 31-year-old murder, hoping to bring resolution and healing to the family of Lorcan O'Byrne. The Angler's Rest is a thriving pub situated in an idyllic part of Dublin. But how did this peaceful, family-run business become the scene of a crime so brutal it continues to shock the nation more than 30 years later? Bernie O'Byrne were a hard-working couple from Dublin. Lar had worked in the bar trade all of his adult life and dreamed that one day he might become the landlord of his own pub. This ambition finally became a reality for the couple in the early 60s when they bought a bar on the edge of Dublin city. The business was the Angler's Rest pub. It was in the Strawberry Beds, beautiful valley just beyond Knock Maroon out by the Phoenix Park. It was the first pub in the Strawberry Beds. It was three pubs, and my mum and dad would have moved there in 1960. The Angles itself was fairly well protected from pretty much the big city that was Dublin. We used to joke it was like Twin Peaks um, because it was a place where nearly time stood still because your neighbours, you knew everybody on a stretch of a four-mile road. The Angler's Rest was an expansive building, which had once been a hotel and the O'Byrne family lived in the spacious accommodation upstairs from the pub. So from when we were born, pretty much, we all helped out. Like, I remember from about seven or eight years of age, sorting bottles on a Saturday morning, and myself and Dorby cleaning tables and cleaning ashtrays and hoovering up and that kind of stuff. So we were a very tight family who, who actually worked quite hard. We were a family of seven and um, five children. Lorcan was the eldest, I came next, then it was a four-year gap. My brother, Jared, um, next brother, Niall, and then the youngest is my sister, Dorothy. My mother used to tell a story that when I was born, um, my father was going to see her one night in the hospital because my father was never there for any of the births, which was obviously a thing at those times. And that on one of the first evenings, Lorcan snuck into the back of the car to go and see me. And I suppose we just had a very special relationship. Lorcan was 25. He had worked in a variety of office jobs when he was younger, when he left school. His dream was to join the Air Corps and become a pilot, but uh, I think he didn't get through the medical or whatever it was at the time. Lorcan's passion for aviation meant he spent most of his free time in the air and eventually managed to secure himself a private pilot's licence. He had a great interest in the Second World War, so he'd always talk to me about it, and again, he passed it on to me, so I used to think he was Superman because he was flying planes, he had a girlfriend. You know, I used to look up a huge amount to him. Although Lorcan had his own interests, he also played an active role in the family business. From my father's point of view, probably straight out of school, he wouldn't have, you know, let him take over or manage or whatever, because he would have been too young. But as the years went by, the two of them had come to an arrangement and Lorcan was going to take over the pub. Things were going well for the O'Byrne family both professionally and personally. And in his early 20s, Lorcan brought his girlfriend, Olive, home to meet the family. Lorcan had been uh, going out with a girl from the west of Ireland and uh, she was always mentioned when he was going away for a weekend or away with some friends. So you kind of realised it was getting a bit more serious than previous relationships. Things moved quickly and on Sunday the 11th of October 1981, Lorcan arrived home from a weekend away with an exciting surprise. He was all cheesy and grinny and, you know, he, he knew something was up, but yet he couldn't say anything. Come on. I've asked her and she said yes. The good news travelled fast and while Lorcan joined some family and friends for a drink in the neighbouring pub, Lorcan's mother and youngest sister Dorothy returned from a relative's house to begin the celebrations. And I remember when he came in to the kitchen, and at that stage I knew he was engaged, and he just grabbed me in his arms and swung me around, and he was, he was just so happy. 
After closing time, the family was joined upstairs by the bar staff to help celebrate Lorcan and Olive's engagement. There would have been probably up to 20 people in the room. So it was quite a big sitting room. We were all sitting around various chairs, cushions, sofas. I was down on the floor looking after the music, trying to play a bit of music and just give a bit of atmosphere. And we were just generally chatting about the, the announcement and we were just delighted, obviously. We were all sitting around having the party. I was sitting over near Lorcan and Olive and Anne. We were all sort of, I think, sitting together. We definitely weren't there that long. And, you know, Niall and his friends were out at at our hall door because those guys would have been waiting to be collected by their parents. Niall would have had a few friends who worked part-time in the pub and he had decided to see his two friends out through our hall door upstairs above the pub and there was a veranda to the side of the house where the steps down to the car park. And we'd been sitting waiting for one of my friends, Roger, to be collected by his father so every now and again I'd open the door to have a look to see was anybody there. So it was at this time that um, I had the door ajar, kind of opened a small bit, um, that I heard footsteps coming really, really fast. And with that, the whole door kind of came in on top of me. And the next thing I knew, I'd got a butt of a shotgun right across the face. The guy who hit me went past me. The second guy dragged me backwards. I remember being pulled through doors and kept my head hit off doors going through. And I eventually ended up in the, the kitchen. Back in the family sitting room, the party was still in full swing. The door opened and somebody shouted, there's a raid. It's a raid. And, and you kind of thought, were they joking or messing or, you know, that kind of thing. Just straight after that then, there was just somebody standing there with a gun and a balaclava. And I definitely thought it was some sort of a prank. All I know is that, like, Lorcan literally stood up and turned around because his back was slightly probably to where the door was. What's going on? That was it, there was a shot, that was it, Lorcan fell. Then I think the raider tried to reverse out of the room. Uh, myself and another man jumped up and grabbed the barrel of the shotgun and couldn't get the shotgun out of, him, out of his, uh, his grip. He was very, very strong and seemed to be very athletic, just couldn't get the shotgun out of his hands. And eventually he managed to wedge it and pull it and the door slammed and we just started screaming. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, the attack on Nile was ongoing. Where is it? I could hear lots of commotion going on somewhere else, but the guy was kind of hitting me and, and looking through the door to see what was going on. Where is it? It's there. And then I remembered him dropping me to the ground, him turning and running, and the other guy coming out past him. In the meantime, you know, we were trying to see how bad Lorcan was, and somebody said, oh, you know, it's his arm. So you kind of think, oh, great, you know, it's, it's only his arm. As Anne rushed to phone the emergency services, Niall followed the two masked intruders who were fleeing towards the pub's car park. As I got to where the balcony was at the pub, I saw them jumping into the car and that's how I was pretty much able to identify the car. Stop! It was a green Hillman Hunter. It had a vinyl roof. And I know the particular models that they had, had were unusual in so far as they had a double headlights. So it was a Hillman Hunter, but I think it was a kind of a special edition one. I hadn't at this stage known that Lorcan had been shot or anything had happened. I just, you know, thought these guys had come in, didn't get what they wanted and ran. So it was only when I actually came back into the house and kind of stood at the door and saw him that I realised um, what had happened. Oh, no, no! <laughs> I couldn't really remember the sequence of how it happened, but we were obviously, you know, on the phone screaming, asking for police, asking for an ambulance. We knew it was serious. Um, we would have brought in blankets or something to put over Lorcan, trying to keep him warm or something. Like he was completely motionless, very bad colour, no, you know, completely unconscious. I remember them carrying him out. And it was for all the world like, like a, a, a stretcher that was made of cloth, like, like, like a body bag, but he was lying on top of it and there was six handles. There was blood slushing around. Where, where he was lying and it going out, and that's when I just caved in. And uh, I remember seeing him going out and he was pale and I was going, Jesus, no. And that's what plays over and over again in my head for the last 30 years. And that was the last time I saw him. Last time I saw him.
I was at home actually when I got a phone call from command and control to say that a young chap had been shot in the angler's wrist and that he'd been shot in the arm. By the time we got to the hospital, we all had a definite idea that, that Lorcan was seriously injured. And um, the, when we got in, we were in the casualty area and we heard that there, that there was a sur you know that he'd been taken straight into surgery. I think we were lucky that there had been a surgeon working there anyway that night, and um, so we kind of felt well, he he he's in with a chance. I would remember at some stage somebody coming out and saying that Lorcan was stable, and I was delighted. And I remember getting coins and going over to a coin box, and I rang the house and I said um, that he was stable, but. Um, he, he died about 10 minutes after that. Unfortunately, the gunshot had also caused fatal internal injuries to Lorcan's chest. We had to break the bad news and the sad, very sad news to the family. And of course, you know, the anguish that we saw there and then, and the pain that people do go through, you know, it's very hard to describe. You could cut the atmosphere, if you like, with a knife. At about two o'clock, I think I remember I was standing in the kitchen, I was against the wall and... <laughs> Uh, the guard in charge came in and I just seen him taking his rosary beads. <laughs> and I just slid down the wall. I just kept, I just kept going now. At one stage the house is very spread out and my mother wanted to go to the bathroom and she didn't want to go on her own. And I went with her and brought her and stayed outside. And um, when we came back, everybody was sort of in shock, I suppose. My my father just wasn't really talking at all. And um, we knew the news had come back and Lorcan had died. That was it. None of us believed it, you know. We didn't want to believe what, what started out as a really nice night, a fantastic night, had basically turned into the worst horror movie you could imagine. The one thing that actually, if you like, settled the whole scene at the time was Michael Kunkan, he actually said, what we'll do now is we'll say a decade of the rosary with the family. And I remember we were all uh, on our knees inside in, in, in a room in the house. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And I have to say, I never concentrated as much ever in my life saying a couple of prayers. It was unreal. I don't think we could believe the space of that short space of time could, that could have, you know, from having a fantastic party and celebration, that in the space of, I don't know, I suppose it was three or four hours, he was dead. And uh, you, 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 you made a judgment in your own mind that you're going to do as much as you can to try and get the people that did this to this family to bring him to justice. On Sunday, the 11th of October, 1981, the O'Byrne family were celebrating the engagement of eldest son Lorcan to his girlfriend Olive, when two masked men entered their home above the Angler's Rest pub. During the raid, one of the intruders shot Lorcan O'Byrne before fleeing the scene. Initially, the gunshot wound was thought to have been relatively minor, but three hours after beginning the festivities in his family home, Lorcan died in hospital. When the Guardi arrived at the scene, they immediately realised that a very serious event had taken place. Uh, it was a, a botched robbery, which uh, tragically resulted in the death of Lorcan. So immediately, a very comprehensive murder investigation was initiated. All the people who were at the party were interviewed, and uh, the, their versions of the events that took place were, were taken in witness statements. Meanwhile, John Fitzpatrick searched the premises for potential forensic clues. It was obvious to me that whoever was carrying the son of shotgun had hit the door and left two indentations on the door. Now, some of the paint had come off the door and went in, obviously, into the firearm because it wasn't on the ground. So my expectation was that I ever got, if I ever got the weapon that was used, that I might find the pain flicks in the gun or stuck onto the gun. With no further trace of the gun evident within the home, 
Gardaí concentrated their efforts on tracking down the Hillman Hunter that Niall O'Byrne had seen the intruders driving away in. As it transpired, Niall was not the only one to have seen this vehicle in the area that evening. The next sighting of that car was at a Garda checkpoint up in Finglas, only a couple of minutes later, where there had been a fatal traffic accident. They drove through. There was no reason to stop them because the thing hadn't been reported that there had been a shooting in the Angles Rest and they had made their way so quickly away from the scene. We were only talking a couple of miles away. Now realising that this car was a crucial piece of evidence, the investigation team endeavoured to track the vehicle down as soon as possible. I was collected by the guards and brought around different areas of Dublin uh, to try and find the car because obviously, you know, I had a good idea what it was and what it looked like. So for about the first four or five days um, in the evening times, when I, they'd call, pick me up and we'd drive around different areas of Dublin to see if we could spot the car in areas they thought it might have been. And eventually, less than two weeks after Lurkin O'Byrne was murdered, John Meredith is stopped by Gardaí driving in the Ballyfermot area. He's arrested, and the man who is the front seat passenger is also arrested. Following his arrest, Meredith quickly confessed to his part in the crime and detailed to Gardaí what had taken place on the night of the 11th of October. The second man was interviewed and later released without charge. What John Meredith was able to tell Gardaí filled in a lot of the blanks, a lot of the picture about what had happened. And he was able to tell them how he and this other person had planned the crime, how they knew Bernie O'Byrne's movements and when she might go to the bank and the type of car she would drive and uh, that they had thought about maybe stealing cash on a Monday but then suddenly decided on the Sunday night to go ahead with the, with the crime, how they had driven from a pub in South Dublin over to Finglas to get this shotgun which was hidden in a hedge. He was able to tell them how they had then put on their makeshift balaclavas, gone into the premises, and how the other man had been carrying the double barrel shotgun and how he had gone first. And he was in the house uh, as Meredith was still basically coming up the steps and going in after him. He was then able to fill in the, the blanks about what happened thereafter, about how the balaclavas had been thrown out the window of the car in Summerhill about how he had listened in to the Half Six radio news on RTE and had heard that the man who had been shot had died and how panic ensued then and he wondered what he was going to do and how he met up with this other man and they decided that uh, they should hide the car at Dublin Airport. So that's what they did. They then went drinking. They went to Ballyfermot and they were drinking there and eventually they decide that they want to move the car, that it's not safe to leave it out in the airport. Eventually it'll be found, it'll be tracked down and the Gardaí will come looking for them. So they actually then go back out, get the car and uh, eventually make their way down to County Kildare to Monaster Revan. Once in Kildare, the two men set about removing the engine of the car and disposing of it in the Grand Canal before setting the vehicle on fire to try to sabotage any potential forensic evidence. Now, unfortunately, in that particular instance, that car was extremely badly burned and the amount of evidence that you get out of it as regards minute forensic evidence that was never going to happen because hairs, fibres, blood and renting, DNA, that was all gone. During questioning, Meredith also gave details as to the whereabouts of the sawn-off shotgun. It was found in a plastic bag in a hedge at the River Road in Finglas, which tied in with the sighting of John Meredith and another individual by a guard who was at, a, at the scene of a traffic accident. And that would have been Meredith and the other man hiding the weapon after shooting Lorcan. When I examined the shotgun, there was paint flakes in the upper barrel. Those paint flakes, we linked that back to Lorcan O'Burn's home. However, with Meredith in custody, it soon became evident that Lorcan's killer was still at large. It was established that John Meredith uh, was actually the second person into the pub. He wasn't uh, the person who had possession of the son of shotgun on that night. 
John Meredith was subsequently found guilty of manslaughter and received a sentence of six years for his part in the crime. I am aware that uh, after uh, John Meredith had been convicted and sentenced for his crime that he did actually make contact with the O'Byrne family uh, seeking forgiveness. John Meredith wrote to my mother asking for my mum's forgiveness and wanting her to kind of absolve him from his involvement in whatever it is but my mum was, was a very religious person and she would be quite happy to forgive anybody but she said she would never forgive him. I think my parents just felt they didn't want to meet this man, they didn't want to talk to him. Um, they didn't just want to have no truck with him whatsoever and that they felt their lives were destroyed. It, he couldn't turn back the clock, he can't undo the damage he had done and what he really should have done was gone and if he was so full of remorse he should have gone there and then and he should have gone to the guards and the police and he should have told the full story. If John Meredith wanted forgiveness the best thing he could have done was to bring the other killer to justice to assist Gardaí, to assist Lorcan's family to do the right thing. During the review process, we were particularly struck with the resolve of the family. They have lived with the death of their brother for the last 31 years, and they've tried to get on with their lives and uh, deal with matters. But you can clearly see that the murder of their brother has had a terrible traumatic effect on the family. My father wasn't the same after Lorcan died. He, he, he changed in that he was brokenhearted. You know, he had lost his son because of a pub, because somebody came to rob a pub, and I think he didn't have the heart to, to go on. You could watch Dad. It was kind of a slow decline. 1981, by 1984, we just knew we had to sell the pub. Before this, my dad would have been an incredibly strong man. But from the day that Lorcan died, he turned into an old man. He probably felt he should have been the one who took the shot, that it was his pub, and he had, had a good life. So for the next 10 years or nine years of his life, he uh, eventually died of lung cancer. And I think in a way he just had switched off. To me, he's, he's, in, he's the second victim of that night because he never, he never got over it. My mother was absolutely heartbroken, um, but she was very strong. She was one of those people that she, she just saw the good things in life and she saw the good things in most people and um, I, I do remember very clearly her saying that if she to choose between being the mother who had lost a son, she would pick that any day over being the mother of somebody who, who, who would have killed him. My mum died in 2009 and uh, I remember something she said pretty much two or three days before she died and she said I said to her, do you still want me to, 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 to do this and to try and, and get this guy and get Lorcan's murder solved and she said to me if he's sitting in a bar somewhere and he sees this photograph coming up on the television and bees of sweater are going down his back she said I'd be satisfied at that because she said just to let him know that he didn't get away with it and that's all she wanted. So, even for her, you know, I want to put this to bed. People who are watching, who are now much older than they were in 1981, who may know small shreds of evidence, little things that might be in their head, that might be just there in the back of their mind, that they might just decide, you know, rather than John Meredith, who went to his grave and could have done so much for our family that they would do something for us now.